Thanks, Dave. So my name is TJ Van Toll. I work for a company called Telerik. If you haven't heard of us before, we're a software development company. We make a lot of UI tools. We're, we're behind Kendo UI, if you know uh, anything about that library. Our logo happens to be a ninja, so I have some of these ninja stress balls that I can distribute throughout this talk for people that choose to, dis choose to participate throughout the talk. Um, but I work on Kendo UI um, some. I work with developers using Kendo UI some. And I'm also a member of the jQuery UI team. So needless to say, a good part of my career is helping developers build things for the web. And in my opinion, the single biggest pain point that people have comes to forms, or it comes down to forms. Because forms are just hard. There's all this weird nuanced syntax you have to learn. There's this interaction with the back end that you have to grok. Um, there's UX considerations. There's accessibility considerations. All these crazy things. And one of the particularly hard things, and the topic of this talk, is with form validation. So I want to ask everybody in this room, how many people here have written form validation code at some point? So it's basically every hand. All right, one more question. How many people here enjoy writing form validation code? OK, we, get, we actually have like five or 10 people back there. So some people. But by and large, this is a task that most developers despise doing. And one of the reasons they hate doing it is because it's, it's really damn hard. Um, so traditionally, before we have the new HTML5 semantics, what you have to do to validate form data um, is something like this. And maybe a library abstracts it for you. But you have to listen to the submit event on a form and then do whatever error checking you want to do. Like this would probably be a required field check, making sure there's a value. And manually stop the prevention of the form, uh, the submission of the form if you detect this error circumstance. And then somehow give feedback to the user, just some sort of message, somehow, some mechanism. Which is really kind of crazy. Um, and so as someone that helps people build these UIs, I welcome any improvement that we get to the native platform that makes this stuff easier. And as it turns out, HTML5 has this massive improvement to form validation in the term in a spec called constraint validation. And constraint validation is just kind of this umbrella term that talks about everything form validation that's in the spec. But basically, it means that instead of writing this crazy JavaScript like this, if you want a required field, you just give an input a required attribute, and the browser is automatically going to prevent the submission of that form and provide a nice little UI to the user to give them some feedback. There's no JavaScript involved to do this. It's just some very simple markup. And if we look at the history of this, believe it or not, the, this spec has been along, around for a very long time. The original spec actually dates back to 2003. Ian Hickson wrote up a, a version of it that was a little more basic than what we have today, but it had things like the required attribute in it, for instance. So that sat around for a while until the HTML5 movement really got started. Opera was the first to implement this in Presto. And then in 2011, Firefox and Chrome came along, and then finally IE. And to me, IE implementing this was actually the signal for at least me personally to take this stuff seriously and to actually look into using it. And so I wrote some articles about this. I, I gave some talks on this. I got really excited about this because it's a really cool set of technologies to anyone that's done non-trivial forms. And this is really cool, but there's one major issue for all of this. No one actually uses HTML5 form validation. I just don't see people using it. Um, so if I had to ask the same question of the audience here, um, basically everybody said they do form validation. How many people here have a live site, a production site, that uses these native validation bubbles? So a couple people. So the answer is not no one, but apparently just a few people do it. By and large, no one does. And so this form here, I actually just use the dev tools to go in and alter the display, because this is not what chase.com, in this case, actually shows you. They actually show you this very helpful alert message when you forget to put in your username and password. And so I say that no one's really using form validation, and it's totally anecdotal. But I happen to be that weird guy who just goes to web forms and just submits them empty just to see what happens. 
And I have yet to see anybody actually using the native bubbles. And in fact, usually what I see is actually rather scary. There are some very bad implementations of form validation on the web. Um, and it's not just bad implementations, and sometimes, or bad in terms of bugs, sometimes there's just some bad UX in place. And so has anybody run across this situation where your data is instantly validated? Like you start typing something and immediately the site goes like, hey, <laughs> that doesn't look right. So this is actually from GitHub. So you can find this behavior on major sites. And there have been lots of studies that show that this is actually a bad idea, that it's best to wait for blur in order to validate that data. And I showed this to my friend, Yearn, and he actually thought that um, if you're familiar with this meme, that this was a, an appropriate usage of this. <laughs> but the other nice thing about using constraint validation is it has some of these UX practices built right into it. And so if I go back to my required field, if I want to require an email address, I just add type of email. And if the user starts to type something invalid, it waits until you go to submit or blur to actually show this bubble and provides a fairly reasonable error message for you. Now, all is not perfect. Um, there, it's not like moving to constraint validation will solve your UX needs, but it has a lot of sane defaults built right into it. But all of this begs a major question. So if constraint validation is really that awesome, then why in the world is no one actually using it in production? Or at the very least, why aren't people using it in mass? Why aren't we seeing these bubbles appear all over the internet? And so through my time with this, with the spec and looking into this, I've identified what I think are the five biggest problems that keep people from using this technology. And I've ordered them from what I think is the biggest problem to what I think is the least significant problem. And what this talk is going to be about is going through this, these list of problems, talking about what they are, talking about how you can work around them, and then finally talking about things that you can actually go and implement in your applications today. And so the, the first thing I have on the list is that browser support for constraint validation is weird, which begs the question, what do I mean by weird? And if you look at the, the support data for constraint validation, and this is from caniuse.com, there's, there's a couple columns that jump out at you. The first is this old IE version, so IE, uh, IE9 and before. And it, as it turns out, this is, actually isn't the weird part. Those older versions of IEs just have zero implementation of constraint validation. So if you support those versions of Internet Explorer, you're going to have to account for that somehow in your code. And we'll talk about that momentarily. But the weird part is actually where this olive color comes in. And actually, Can I Use should be using that same olive color for iOS Safari and the Android browser as well, because it's the same problem. And that's, Can I Use's key defines that olive color as partial support. And there's partial support because the implementation in Safari, iOS Safari, and Android is, is kind of weird, in that these three browsers, um, all of these like, WebKit-based browsers, they do have a complete implementation of all the constraint validation APIs. And so Safari knows what this required attribute is. And if you were to inspect that element, you would see all the DOM properties you need on it. It knows things like it has a validity object on it with some Booleans that tells you things about this input. It also knows about the CSS pseudo classes. So I could style this with uh, colon required, for instance. But the one difference is that um, in Chrome here, you'll see that it actually enforces these attributes. But if I switch over to Safari, even though Safari knows what all of this is, it lets submissions go through. Which, it's basically like they have a full implementation, but it's just turned off. There is no, there is no bubbles or nothing actually that prevents submissions. Which means, if you want to implement constraint validation today, if you want to move forward with these specs, there's really two scenarios that you have to account for. You have to account for these older versions of Internet Explorer, and you have to account for these WebKit-based browsers with kind of this bastardized implementation. Um, and there's, there's different ways around this, and we'll talk about several of them. But by and large, I like to think of the solution for these problems as the same. And that is, I like to think of the server as my fallback for my client-side validation mechanism. 
And that's because even with this HTML5 spec, it's important to keep in mind that your client-side constraints or your client-side validation really is no substitute for your server-side stuff. Um, so for instance, people could submit to your form using some other means of sending an HTTP request, such as curl. I'm also sure that most of the people in this room could tell me how to remove a required attribute from a field um, and get a form to submit anyways. And this is even more important with, as we start to think of our backends as more endpoints, not really postbacks, but more APIs or services that can be invoked from multiple locations. And so I threw together a quick demo of what I mean, or a way of handling this. And so I have a simple form that just has a name and email. And I have this rigged up so that in Chrome, this just very basically um, uses all the native stuff. So the first field is required, the email is required, um, and the email obviously enforces that it's a valid email address and needs that data. And so it, it uses the native stuff for everything, but if I head over to Safari here and just go ahead and submit this blank, the experience I've built is that I'm showing this list of error messages on the top of the page. And what I'm doing for this is, um, here's the basic markup I have for this form. But really all I'm saying is there's, there's, no, there's no extra JavaScript script constraints here. I don't have any error messages sitting on the client side. Instead, I'm saying just go ahead and send my data to the back end, which I have defined over here. And this is the part of the talk where you can judge me for using PHP. But the, the idea here is not really the specific syntax, because the PHP syntax is actually quite horrible, but rather the approach in that Here's my individual validation checks, like did you provide me a name? Uh, but what the thing to note is that instead of, say, throwing a 500 error here because I have invalid data that comes in, instead I'm building this data structure where I'm passing back um, an array or an object that contains these error messages. And what I do at the end here, like I said, the details aren't really important, but basically that if I detect errors, I go ahead and encode a JSON response. So that in my HTML here, when I come back, I have this failure function defined. And really all it does, it's doing two things. The, the first thing it's doing is highlighting the individual labels. So it finds the labels based off that data structure. And the other thing it's doing is just building that list on the top of the page. And the specific details aren't important. The idea, though, is that by coding our backend in that way, by building a, basically a functional backend, or one that returns usable error messages back, you have a fallback for any situation. Um, any old browser, this, would, this approach would work fine in IE6. You just come back and display the error messages that you have. And it also works fine in Safari. Now the one downside to this is it does require a round trip to the server. And there's some UX studies that show that instant feedback is good. Blurring the data on, or validating the data on Blur provides the best user experience. And so especially if you support iOS Safari or iOS Safari is an important browser to you, it may not be acceptable to take that entire round trip to the server for all of those users. And so we'll, for that, we're going to need to do a little bit more. But the basic premise is coding your backend in a way of returning messages is just, in general, a good practice. It also makes, if your service is being used as something like an API, it also makes it more, uh, more usable to those people as well. Because let's say someone tries to use my crappy PHP service here, and I document that it takes a name and email. If they fat finger one of those parameters, they're going to have an easier job debugging it, seeing a nice error message than some random stack trace to dig through. So that's the first problem. The next thing I want to move on to is some of those more complex use cases. So that works well when you have this, this really simple thing. This form is obviously trivial for the purposes of a demo. But things get a little messier as you get into more custom interactions. And so the next thing I have is that customizing these error messages, error messages is unfortunately verbose. And it comes down to set custom validity is a really weird API. And so let's say you have this required email field, and you just want to to change the error message that it uses. So what you have to do is get a reference to that input, which is what this uh, reference ends up being here. And then I have this set error message def defined that runs when this page loads, and it also runs whenever this field changes. And I'm using the validity object, which is part of the DOM API, uh, 
to determine what is wrong with this field. Like, is it required? Is that the problem? Is it that they provided an invalid email address? And then I call set custom validity. And this does work. So if I go in here and try to provide a, a bad value, I get my custom error messages. But there's still one problem with this code. Does, does anybody see what the issue is? So what's weird about set custom validity is that in addition to determining the error message that you're using, it also determines whether a field is valid or not. So if I go in here and create a problem, for instance, and then fix it, oops, and actually fix it, I'm still going to get this error message. Because I actually have to go in here and tell the browser when this is valid. So I have to call bad uh, set custom validity and very intuitively pass an empty string. Because, of course, the empty string is the way you tell the browser that this field now contains valid data. And so the problem here is this, this is unfortunately complex. If you just want to set a very simple error message, all of a sudden you're writing eight lines of JavaScript to do so. And obviously, this will multiply as you're building more and more complex forms. And this is something that hasn't really been ignored. When Firefox first put their implementation of this in place, they added their own custom vendor prefixed attribute to deal with this. And so they have this xmoz error message field, which works as you would expect. If I switch over to Firefox here, and that when I submit, you can see that Firefox has some positioning issues with Zoom, but I do get the custom error message without having to use any JavaScript in order to do it. Now, Firefox actually took this implementation to the spec itself. They submitted a, a ticket for this to the W3C, but for better or worse, it was shot down. This is the response from Ian Hickson, and basically his argument against this was, well, how is this going to handle when you have a field that can be invalid for multiple reasons? And so we saw this with the email field with the type email and the required attribute. But this gets even crazier when you consider the, the example he gives, which is input type number, as number inputs can be invalid for required, min, max, step, pattern, type. I think, I think, that's, I think max length as well. And so this mechanism doesn't really handle this. It, maybe, potentially, it could be extended to handle this use case, but for better or worse, that never happened. So unfortunately, if you want to use constraint validation today, you either have to code to these verbose APIs or use some sort of, add some sort of sugar yourself to help you build these messages, or even maybe use a library that does it as well. And we'll look at that in a minute. But there is one thing I want to mention about customizing these error messages. There's a little uh, tweak you can do to the title attribute. And so I have an example here. Um, in Chrome, I'm using the pattern attribute here to say, I would like this field to contain five numbers. And because unlike the other attributes, um, like let's say if you have a max of 10, the browser is able to build an intelligent error message when the user types in 11 because it knows that the max is 10. But since the pattern accepts any arbitrary regular expression, and you can write a regular expression to do any number of crazy and or stupid things, the browser doesn't know, like, why is this field invalid? So the spec has this little clause in it that says, you can actually provide a title attribute to provide some context for that error message. And so if I type some junk here, you can see that the way Chrome chooses to implement this is they show the, their error message on top, and then they show that custom title attribute that you provide as context on the bottom. Now Chrome actually has one little quirk in it in that it will actually show the title attribute for any constraint validation issue. So if I just make this field required, Chrome will show that as well. Oh, that is. Um, but unfortunately, the, this is something that I followed up with, with the mailing list. And the spec only dictates that you must show it for pattern, at, pattern attribute mismatches. And unfortunately, other browsers chose not to implement it this way. So just know that if you try to use the title attribute for context, that that's only going to work in Chrome unless you're dealing with a pattern attribute. So messages in general, just to summarize, it's kind of quirky to actually, to actually play with them. 
Another thing that's tricky with them is aggregating the messages or building that air box that I showed as part of the first example. And the reason this is tricky is that there's no good way with the current spec to determine when the user attempted to submit a form, which sounds kind of crazy, and I think a specific example helps here. Now, you remember from pretty much the very first example I showed here that the way we implement form validation today revolves around the submit event. You add a submit event listener, you do your checking, and you prevent that submission as appropriate. But in a constraint validation world, the spec dictates that if there are constraint validation issues, don't actually fire the submit event until those are fixed. And so if I attempt to submit this form here, you can see that I'm never actually getting to the alert, and I have to, have to actually go the extra step of providing valid data before I get to that point. And so this is kind of a weird quirk, but you can get around it fairly easily. And I threw together an example that shows how you can do it. You can see that I, I have this implemented in Chrome where I'm still using the bubbles, but I'm also showing the list of error messages on the top of the screen. And the way you actually do it, if I scroll down to my code here, is that instead of listening for form submissions, you actually listen for clicks on submit buttons, which is kind of convoluted and seems like a weird thing to do, but it actually works. It even works for the case of print, pressing enter on input fields as well, because per the spec, that will also click those submit buttons. And so I use that to drive this logic. And this show of all error messages is very similar to the logic that I showed in the previous example. All it's really doing is building up that list on the top of the screen. The only extra thing is that I'm using some of the hooks in the constraint validation API to help me build this. For instance, I'm using the invalid pseudo class to gather all the fields that happen to be invalid, so I don't have to manually check that. And I'm actually, for the messages themselves, I'm just using the validation message property, which is also part of the DOM API that constraint validation provides. And so all of this lets me build this list on the top of the screen. But one thing that's kind of interesting and maybe unexpected is that if I load this same example in Safari, it actually works fine here as well, minus the lack of any bubble that Chrome and Firefox and IE would also provide. And that's because what I'm doing in this example, which you can also use to work around these, this WebKit browser quirk, is that I'm actually listening to the submit events. So I said in constraint validation compliant browsers, by the time you get here, you're always going to have valid data. It won't fire it until you do. But in these WebKit-based browsers, you certainly can get here with invalid data. But since they implement the APIs, you can just immediately in it say, hey, this, let me call this check validity method on the form, and I'll instantly know whether I have valid data. So basically what this is saying is if I, got, if I submitted and I have invalid data, just go ahead and prevent that submission. And then the very last thing in here says, all right, well, then let me find the first invalid field and give it focus, because that's the only other thing that the spec dictates. And as it turns out, if you build your own implementation of showing error messages, as I'm doing here with this error box here, this is really the only block of code you need to support these WebKit-based browsers. So I'll switch back here. Um, one thing cool coming, uh, I said the one kind of crazy part was the whole submit button thing that you had to listen for clicks on that rather than submit events on the form. And the good news is the spec has been recently changed in that an invalid event is being added to form elements. So in the future, um, no browsers have actually implemented this, but in the future you would be able to change that code to just listen for the invalid event on the form and use that as your trigger to clear and build that air box that shows on the top of the field or to build any other custom UI that you have in mind. And so speaking of invalid, and I used it as part of that previous example, um, the other problem, or what I consider to be the next biggest problem, is that the invalid pseudo class uh, doesn't exactly work like you'd want it to work. And what I mean by that is that it, it applies immediately as soon as you visit a form. So take this example here where I have a required field, well, if I wanted to do some styling to highlight invalid fields for my user, I can use the invalid pseudo class, and it works just fine. But notice how this field is already read. So if I were presenting this to a user from UX studies, um, we know that this confuses the hell out of people, that they arrive on this form and they're being told that they already made mistakes. So this is really uh, not actually intuitive. 
And this is another area where Firefox did some, did some work on when they first added their implementation. And they created this Moz UI invalid pseudo class. And the way it works is actually really slick in that you can see I'm applying the same background red rule. But when I head to this form, it's not actually applying this. And I have to do one of two things to do so. I can either interact with this field and blur it, in which case the styling gets applied. If I refresh, the other thing I can do is submit the form itself. <laughs> Again, the positioning is off. But the logic for the pseudo class actually, or the pseudo selector, actually works as you would like it to. Now, there is some better news on this front in that Firefox did successfully get this added to the spec. It is part of the selectors level four spec under the name user dash air. And it works pretty much exactly like Moz UI invalid works, which is cool. The bad news is no browsers at the moment have actually implemented this. So this isn't something you can use today. But I wanted to show a quick example of how you can work around this problem. And so I have a very basic input here. I'm applying the same background red styling um, under the hood. But I have it working like Moz UI invalid does in that it won't apply it until I either interact with this field or I attempt to submit this field. And all I'm doing, switch over here, is that instead of using the invalid pseudo class directly, I'm either preface, prefacing it with this dot interacted class name as part of the selector, or I'm saying um, there's no space there, or if the element itself has an interacted class name. And so I just have a little bit of code down at the bottom here. I have the exact same of co um, code to manually detect form submissions by listening to clicks on submit buttons. And I say, all right, when this happens, go ahead and add that interactive class name to the form, which will trigger those CSS rules. And then the other thing I do is say, anytime any form elements blur, add an interactive class name to those as well and use that as the hook to apply my styling. So it is a little unfortunate that you have to write this code. It seems awfully unnecessary to work around something that's mostly kind of wrong or limiting in the platform itself. But the good news is it's really not that much work. And in the future, when the implementations actually catch up, you can swap this entire selector with just a simple colon user dash air pseudo class. So that brings us to the last problem. And I have this as the last one on my list because I personally don't think this is a huge deal. But I've talked to some designers that think that this is a major problem with the implementation. And that some people um, may think that these things are a little bit ugly. And want desperately, have this deep desire to actually change these things. And if you do some Googling for this, you'll actually find that it used to be possible in Chrome, at least. Um, so when Chrome first implemented this, back when they were based in WebKit, they provided these hooks that you could use to customize these things. And so you could build something like something crazy, kind of like this, if you wanted to. Or you could just do these simple tweaks to kind of make the bubble match your site's color scheme. And so, it was kind of slick. It was kind of a neat little thing you could, you could do to customize. But Chrome 28 actually removed these things. It was part of their move uh, from WebKit to Blink, or shortly after that, that they wanted to clean up a lot of these WebKit prefixed things. They also improved their positioning logic and just chose to rip these things out. So unfortunately, um, if you want to style these bubbles, you really can't. <laughs> The only thing you can do um, is you can turn them off and build your own custom implementation. And so I mentioned earlier that there was an invalid event coming for form elements. We actually already have one as part of the spec for individual form elements. And so what I'm doing here is I have this required input. And I'm adding an invalid event listener down here. And I'm just preventing the default action of that. And I have this required field. But as I try to submit, I'm not actually getting any bubbles. And I actually can show that I can comment this out. And the bubbles come back. One weird, kind of weird quirk about turning off these bubbles is that they don't bubble. Kind of a play on words. Uh, but they don't bubble. So that means you can't, say, attach a handler to the document or to a form to actually suppress these things. You can either, either attach a listener to each individual form element or if you're familiar with 
how the DOM event model works, you can also add a listener during the capture phase. So here I'm saying listen during, or attach a listener to the form itself, but during the capture phase to prevent the bubbles that way on an entire form. But of course, if you're going to get rid of the default, the native way of showing these validation errors, that means you have to do something. You don't want to leave the user sitting at a, a form with no feedback. And there's many options you can do. So you can build something as simple as that error box I showed before. If that's how you choose to show your errors, that could be your fallback for this. And you could just take the additional step to suppress the native bubbles so you have your custom implementation in place. Or you could build your own bubbles. I thought I'd show a quick example of how you could do this with Kendo UI. And so I have this email field, and I just rigged up this, this tooltip widget to just show basic validation message, messages as I interact with this thing. And the code behind this is pretty simple. All I'm doing is I'm saying, let's build a Kendo tooltip, and really just saying for the content, just use the browser's validation message. That way I don't have to manage my own messages. I have a few lines of code to just manage the visibility of this thing, show and hide it on blur and focus. And then I have a final listener to just say, suppress the native one that occurs. And of, of course, there's any number of ways that you could implement this thing. You could use a jQuery UI tooltip to do this for sure as well. I do want to say be careful when you go down this route of a truly custom bubble, because as it turns out, it's a really hard thing to build. Um, if you go back here, especially as you start to consider um, different screen sizes and such, like what happens if this field is on a mobile device and it's all the way at the bottom of the screen? Like how do you make sure that message always shows? And then if you're showing an arrow, how do you make sure the arrow flips and such? So there's all this weird nuanced logic. So I do encourage people that if you're building something more complex to try looking down the library route first, because it's a little harder problem than you may think it is. But if you're going with a more simple UI, like showing errors in a box on the screen or underneath the error messages, then by all means, take the route of suppressing the bubbles and using that approach to build your custom UI. And so that's the bubble one. And that actually brings me to the end of my list of problems. And so I think, in general, browser support is the biggest issue that we've, we face when we tend to implement constraint validation. But then there's all these other strange things, some of which have reasonable workarounds, some of them don't. And so the last thing I want to talk about is strategies that you can actually use, take back to implement in your applications today. And so I limited this down to three options. And the first is the one I already showed, just to have a server-side fallback only. And I have the same demo that I showed here earlier. And again, this approach is just to use constraint validation exactly as it is. Use all the native attributes, new, use the native DOM API, but then wire in the logic in your server to pass back reasonable error messages. And then as a last step, take your client and consume those error messages and rig up some sort of way to display those to your users. And I think this is actually a good first step for any validation approach, regardless if you want to build something more complex on top of it. This approach actually works really well for simple forms. Like, let's say you just have a small form where you need to collect the user's email address, and that's all that there is to it. There's no reason you couldn't just type required and type equals email on this and build some very simple fallback mechanism that ties into your server just to show an error message if the user screwed that up. The other nice thing this does is, especially if you keep it simple, you keep from having to duplicate your error messages. So your error messages themselves live on the server side, but your client side code stays nice and clean. It's nice and easy to develop and maintain. So that's one option. But as I mentioned before, there are some limitations to those approaches. Like if you want something really custom, you have to start to dig a little deeper into the APIs or do a little more. Especially when you're talking about the server side fallback, you have that round trip to go to a server, which may or may not be acceptable based off the browsers that you support and the browsers that are important to you. So I wanted to suggest a few approaches that actually take a step further and give you a little more customizability. And the next one would be polyfills. And so by a polyfill, I mean a library that takes the extra effort to make all the things of constraint validation available to browsers that don't have them implemented natively. And so there's a couple different browsers that provide these sort of polyfills for constraint validation. 
I'm only going to talk about one today. There's one I, I like to recommend, and that's WebShims. And WebShims is a polyfill, so that means in browsers that have support natively available, such as Chrome, I'm not actually getting a different experience because it just detects that support is here and just silently does nothing. But if I head on over to a browser that doesn't have support and load this thing up, you can see that WebShims actually packages a complete bubble replacement to use to kind of mimic browsers that have support. And if I were to load this thing up in older versions of IE, you would see the same type of approach. So IE 9 and before don't have these APIs available, but with something like WebShims with a true polyfill, you could actually use these APIs. You could use set custom validity, put those in place, and actually deploy them to your applications, your live applications. And so that's nice if you actually want to stick to the native APIs, if it's important to you to code to the specs and to code to standards. But sometimes, and I've been there as well, and oh, last thing I should mention about WebShims is that in addition to being a polyfill, it does have more robust configuration options. It does have things like helpers to help you build error messages as well, if you do need a little bit more. But where I was going is sometimes you really need that incredibly custom experience. You, like, you don't want to bother with all these quirks in the platform. You don't have to worry about how set custom validity works or how you're going to format up your messages. You just want to get form validation done and move on to the more important things in your application. And that's where I think this last option is, or just using a library that's based off of HTML5. And I actually think it's easier to show what I'm talking about with some examples. And so probably the, the best example of this is the jQuery validation plugin by Yearn. And actually, how many people here have used the, the validate plugin? Cool, quite a, quite a number of people in the audience. And so it was written by Yearn way back in 2006, and he's actually he's done a very good job on it. He still maintains it to this day. And what's nice about using this approach, so I have this exact same form here. And the default behavior actually gives me a pretty nice experience where I already get nice error messages built for me. I get the custom focus management as well. His plugin does the extra work of making sure these error messages are accessible so I can feel comfortable that screen readers are going to be able to read this data. And it's also far easier to use than the native APIs. Um, this is the WebShims code. So the validation code. All I really have to do is select the form and call validate. And the validate plugin has options for more advanced configuration options, like it has this nice hash that I can provide for more elegant messages. But what I like about using a library like this is that, at the very least, I may be somewhat abandoning the core of the constraint validation spec and that I'm using this API to kind of subvert it. Um, and actually, if you look at how the validation plugin is implemented, it actually takes the form itself and adds this no validate attribute, which is basically telling the browser, don't bother validating anything. I got it. I'm going to handle this with custom JavaScript. And, but the nice thing about this is that my markup is exactly the same. I didn't actually have to change the markup from my polyfill example or my server-side fallback example to use this. The validate plugin knows what the required, the required attribute is. It knows how to use it. It knows how to put in intelligent error messages for it. The same thing for my type equals email attribute here. So it makes as a nice starting point that at least if, even if your JavaScript isn't written to the spec and isn't working around some of those quirky behaviors, that at least you're writing your markup to that standard. And so with that in mind, the last thing I'm going to mention, or the last plugin, is Kendo UI also has a validator plugin as well. And it's actually heavily inspired by Yearn's work on the, validate, by the, on the validate plugin. It actually works very similarly. The one difference, um, there's actually two differences I'll point out with how Kendo UI's work works. And the first is that it has integration with the Kendo UI theming system. So if you're using Kendo UI for other things, you can get a look that just meshes. The other thing that I think is interesting, and it'd be neat to see if we could actually get this sort of thing natively implemented, is that Kendo UI has this mechanism for declaratively specifying error messages, that you can use this data dash reason field is invalid dash message attribute, and Kendo UI will look for this and apply that message automatically. And again, all you have to do, 
the, the validate plugin uses a validate jQuery plugin and the Kendo UI is Kendo validator. But it works pretty much the same and you have a lot of the same configuration options in place. And so hopefully, um, hopefully using some of these examples, I've shown that you can be one of the first people that I see actually using these behaviors in production. It would make me very happy if I fat finger some data and actually see the native bubbles. It would really bring a smile to my face. So um, please give it a shot. If you have any other questions about it, uh, feel free. I'll be around the conference for the next two, few days. Feel free to grab me, reach out to me on Twitter if any questions you may have. The last thing I'll mention is, as a shameless plug, is I just finished a, the, the final version of my book, jQuery UI in Action. And Manning is actually offering um, an inexplicable 43% off to the people who attend this conference. So don't worry about writing this down. I'll tweet out the link to the, the slides, and I'll tweet out this code as well. But if you're interested, I'd, I'd certainly appreciate it. And that's all I have. So thank you. And we have about five minutes for questions which if you ask a good enough question, TJ may throw something at you, and if you ask a really bad one, he may do the same. So <laughs> ask your questions carefully. Sorry. My question is related to the validator of Kendo UI. I am already using that, uh, that component in, a, uh, in the current project that I'm working on, but I noticed that uh, it has some problems with the Ajax functionality. I don't know if I am missing something or uh, there's a specific behavior. Um, so it should support that use case fine with Ajax and showing to it. If you want to give with me afterwards and show me the specifics, we can look into it. But it certainly should support that, that situation. You've got the right man there, I think. Uh, let me go over here in the... So my question has to do with a lot of times when you do like an email validation, you have to contact the server to figure out if it's actually valid. So that's an asynchronous validation thing. Is there anything in, this, in the spec anywhere in the plugins that facilitates that kind of interaction? Um, so what you could do um, is you could go back, do your AJAX call, and on the way back, use set custom validity to actually show that button and to put it in place. There's one kind of weird part of the, the spec that says you can't, actually, um, you can't actually trigger constraint validation. It's kind of this, this weird bug that you can call set check validity to, to see whether a form is valid, but you can't really trigger it, which is this, this weird edge case. But there's another method called report validity that's coming to the spec as well. So when that method lands, you would be able to get back from the server, say, oh, this is invalid. Set, call set custom validity on the email with your custom validation message, and then call the report validity on the form to show that error message. But you're right, like, that gets back to the verbosity of the spec itself and how it's not quite, hasn't really caught up to real world use cases quite yet. So there will be a scenario for that sort of thing in the future. But at the moment, like, the amount of code you have to write just makes it silly to do instead of a custom validation approach. Uh, so we actually just rolled out a new version of our corporate website, and this is the approach that we took. We used the native HTML5 validation, and then uh, we're taking an incremental approach. We put in a little bit of a polyfill to handle uh, the WebKit-based browsers so they don't just ignore it and submit, and we have server-side validation as a fallback in general, and that handles all our older IE cases. The next step is we're going to add a little bit more sugar, make it some prettier, pretty much what you were showing. But we have run into one weird thing, and you saw it with the zoom. Um, occasionally, we have positioning issues with the bubble. So we know that we can't style the bubbles, and we're, we're wanting to keep them, the native ones. But uh, the most annoying is we've got a fixed header at some, during some place of the site. And so if there's a form and you scroll, you know, you've gone through it and you go down to the bottom to submit and you hit submit and you've left an early field open, then it scrolls back up to try to display it. <clears throat> and 
you get the field, but the bubble is actually like way up, nowhere near it, because the browser is confused by that fixed positioning. Have you run into that, or any ideas? I, I've certainly ran into that sort of things. I mean, the, the presentation would be an example of it. And actually, that was the biggest reason that Chrome did their rewrite, because they had a lot of edge cases in their implementation. And so Chrome has actually fixed most of those, and I've had pretty good success with Chrome. Like, I haven't ran into that specific situation that you talked about. But I think, unfortunately, the best recourse we have at the moment is to submit a bug to the browser and hope that they can do it. And unfortunately, and I think as, as you're getting at, like working around that, I don't even know. Like It's going to be a hard thing to kind of work around. Um, and so you could certainly, in that specific instance, suppress the bubble, like come up with something custom just for that field, just to work around the bug until they, they hopefully patch it at some time. But that's really your only recourse at the moment that I know of. And we are out of time. I'm sure TJ ah. can catch up with you. Uh, w one last question. Uh, do you validate? Do I validate? <laughs> yes. Parking. OK. Never <laughs> mind. All right. Thank you very much, TJ. Thank you.